when it begins, and it's sort of an artist about 400 years. Watch kind of like history documentaries about it, because just this last year they went in, they redid it. But it is called... Good morning, church, and Merry Christmas. We hope you're having a wonderful holiday with your friends and family, and we're also glad that you've chosen to spend this weekend with us. If this is your first time joining us here at First Baptist, go ahead and let us know in the comments that you're here. You can also go to fbcwax.org slash join if you would like to join the church or if you would like more information about getting involved. You can also find our website and other helpful resources in the description below or through our Facebook page. Next week, we will be back in person for service at our usual times of 9 and 11.15. Before we begin with worship, let's take a moment to pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day and this time that we get to join together in worship. We thank you for the birth of your son and the gift of salvation that was made possible week, through we him. We just thank you for this time for of year that we get to spend with friends and family and, and all of the joy and Before moments we that we get to worship. enjoy together. Please may this morning Let's be used for your glory and may we see you some Heavenly way Father, through it. In Jesus' name, amen. It all began here in darkness stuck in our brokenness, wandering, directionless, in need of a grace we knew nothing about. It's not much of a beginning, but this is where we were. Fast forward to a starry night in Bethlehem. You see, while we were lost in darkness, God was consumed by love, a love which led him to do the unimaginable, a love which would cost him his son. That night, the heart of Christmas began beating with a rhythm that would change the world. Jesus, the Son of God, our Savior, was born. Grace in a manger, love in the flesh. Hope had overcome hopelessness. Mercy had triumphed over brokenness and love had overpowered the darkness. Today, we celebrate that moment. We worship our Messiah, and we stand in awe of the life-changing gift God has given us. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, the true heart of Christmas.
I hope you have had a wonderful Christmas already. And if you're like most Americans, uh, you probably did one of the following things. You know, they say statistically, 68% of Americans open presents, and I hope you had the opportunity to do that already. 61% of Americans say they visit family or friends for Christmas, and maybe you got a chance already to do that. 31% of Americans say they watch a game of football, maybe you've, you've watched something already on television, or maybe you built a fire in the fireplace. 15% of Americans say they do that. Hey, did you leave food out for Santa Claus this year? Uh, 10% of Americans say they do that. Or are you one of those really unfortunate people this year, you were maybe sick, or you had to stay home alone, and you're 4% of the population in years gone by, but I have a feeling with COVID, that number is a whole lot bigger this year. You know, 2% of Americans still go caroling at Christmas, but there are still 39% of Americans who will attend church for Christmas. And I'm so glad that you are tuning in, as we say, to this worship service, this digital online worship service together and studying God's word for this Christmas season. We're bringing to completion today this series we've been calling a God-sized Christmas. And all this month we've been talking about what does it look like to open up what God wants for us and how we can give to others a God-sized Christmas. Well, you know, there's a story about a baby somewhere in Europe that was born to an extremely wealthy family. And they invited guests to come to the christening of this new child. And as they walked into the house, everyone took their, their wraps, their garments, and they placed them in a room. And then after all of the guests arrived and the party was taking place, uh, someone asked the question, hey, where's the baby? <laughs> and they realized they didn't know where the baby was, and they began a frantic search around this huge palace, this mansion, until finally they remembered, oh, we put the baby in the room with the bed where all of the garments had been placed on top of that poor little baby. And you know, I've often thought of that story as a kind of parable of our modern world, that the message of Jesus Christ, the baby that was born, and all that goes in with that is often covered up in the layers and the wrappings of our culture. 
And sometimes you have to pull back all those layers in order to figure out and to see the real, as we say, reason for the season. And what I want us to do today is I want us, as we finish this series on a God-sized Christmas, to do just exactly that. The title of our, of our message today is, Let's Go to Bethlehem and See. Now, those words come literally right out of the, out of the story of the we call the Christmas story that's recorded for us in Luke's gospel. I'm not gonna read the whole Christmas story right now. You know that story about how there was a census and how Mary and Joseph came to Bethlehem and that's where the baby Jesus was born and how that there were shepherds out in a field and they had an angelic visit. It brought a message to them about what had just taken place there in Bethlehem. And this is where we pick up in Luke chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. If you've got a Bible, you can follow along. Otherwise, it may be an app, or you can just read here on the screen uh, with me. It says, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see. That's the title of the message. This thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Today, if we're going to pull back all the wrappings of cultural Christmas and we're to go back to Bethlehem and see the thing that happened, then we sort of put ourselves in the shoes of the shepherds for a moment and we begin to see what they saw. The text tells us the first thing that they saw, of course, was a baby. And in fact, Christmas is a story about the birth of a baby. But here's the problem. In our culture today, there's a real temptation to make Jesus into just a baby, just an ordinary human being, to trivialize or to marginalize the significance of Jesus. In fact, this is the original temptation. You know, when, when the tempter took Jesus into the wilderness... And, you know, he said, hey, turn, this, turn these rocks into bread. Listen to the way he, he words this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. It says, the tempter came to him and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Notice how that sentence starts? If you are the son of God. Now, I can, as I read that, I can remember being in, in college and sitting in a Greek class and my Greek professor teaching us about this particular verse and how in the original language, the, this is a second class conditional clause. <laughs> and that means that translators should translate it like this. Since you're the son of God, because here's the truth, the devil knows that Jesus is the son of God. But what he's doing in this moment is he's challenging him. He's, he's calling into question whether or not he is. And I think one of the temptations of our culture today is to trivialize Jesus. The temptation is just to bring him down. Hey, you're not really all that who you say you are. You're not really that significant. And the temptation is is just to make Jesus into, you might say, just a baby. This we see sometimes in Christmas. We call it Christmas music. You know, there's a story about a a music director, a choir director, sending one of his choir members to go get some sheet music and went to the music store and, and walked into one of these music stores. You probably remember these. We can show you a picture. We don't see too many of these anymore. But went into one of these music stores and spoke to the clerk behind the desk and asked this question. Do you carry any religious sheet music? The, the clerk was a young student and sort of she scratched her head and she said, well, some of the Christian some of the Christmas music might be religious. And I've always found that to be an interesting comment, isn't it? Some of the Christmas music might be religious. Now, you kind of have to ask yourself the question, how could that possibly be? I mean, Christmas is about Jesus. Shouldn't all the Christmas music be religious? But you and I both know that you can go through the whole month of December, you can listen to Christmas music on the radio all day, and you can sing about jingle bells and decking the halls, you can sing about Rudolph's red nose, and about how grandma got ran over by a reindeer, and you can absolutely learn nothing 
about Jesus Christ. In fact, one of the things that we've done culturally with Christmas is we have trivialized and marginalized the significance of what the shepherds originally saw when they looked down into that manger. They saw a baby, and his name was Jesus. But you know, that's not all they saw as they looked down. The text in Luke's gospel tells us that they also saw a sign. You know, when when we talk about seeing signs today, we think of something you see on the side of the road. But the word sign is also a part of a word we use every single day. When you write a document and you are a check or you fill out your name on a form, you often are asked to put your signature on there. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but the word signature and the word sign is the same word. A signature is something in which you signify, you give a sense of authorization that you have seen this, you have witnessed this, you've experienced this. And as these shepherds will go, they will see a sign, they will see the signature of God that God has been involved in this thing that's happened. In fact, this is what the angels told them was the sign. It's Luke chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. It says that today in the town of David, that's Bethlehem, it's where David was born and raised, a savior, in Greek, soter, has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Christ, and the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby. Well, we just said that. Wrapped in clothes. Well, we would expect a baby to be wrapped in clothes. But then look what it says finally and lying in a manger in a feeding trough. Now there's a lot going on in this little verse of scripture. And I don't wanna spend a lot of time talking about it, but I do want you to know that as it begins to describe Jesus, Luke, the gospel writer, and the angelic message uses titles that are the highest political and religious titles that are on the planet. In fact, if you were to go into Rome and to, and to talk to Caesar, one of the most famous titles of Caesar across the Roman Empire was that he was Rome's savior. He was the soter. And then you look at this word, the Lord. This is one of the things that they were told to do to say that Caesar is Lord. In other words, we are talking about the titles of the most highly exalted person on the planet. And then this word, the Messiah, was a Jewish word that was used for a Davidic king, the the, the highest person in the land of Israel. But for 600 years, there had not been a Messiah. There had not been a Messiah, and so they looked forward to the day God would send the Messiah, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. In other words, what happens is all these titles are just sort of stuck together. And the message of heaven, the signature and sign of heaven is when you're gonna go into Bethlehem, you're gonna see not just a baby, but you are gonna see the most highly exalted person that you could ever imagine, and he has been born that way by by right of his birth. He is Messiah and Lord and Savior. But here is what's so interesting. You're not finding him in a palace in Rome. You're not even finding him at at David's palace in Jerusalem. You're not finding him in some mansion somewhere. You're finding him in this little town called Bethlehem, and you're not finding him in a nice house, but in a guest room. In fact, you're finding him in a place where animals were kept. You're finding him in a place where animals eat. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes, but all around him is the food that animals eat. The the juxtaposition between the highly exalted title of who he is and the humble place in which he is at, that is the sign. That is the signature of God that says that this is the one. This is the one that we've all been hoping for and longing for. Now, One of the things that happens in the Christmas story is we tell this story year after year. And as we tell this story, we often, if we're not careful, we'll miss that there is a whole other layer of meaning in the Christmas story. 
You know, we know Jesus is the Messiah. We know that he is the, the, the Savior. We know that he's the Lord because we, you know, we hear that a lot. But what we often forget is, is that there is a whole other realm that Jesus is entering into. In other words, Jesus isn't gonna come and become the king and, and build a palace or to build an earthly kingdom, but he will come and say that he is bringing the kingdom of God into the world. But he will explain that his kingdom is not a political kingdom, it's a spiritual kingdom. And as Jesus is born in Bethlehem, God is announcing his spiritual invasion of his kingdom into this world. And he is challenging in the unseen realm the spiritual kingdom of darkness. And that's what the whole rest of the New Testament tells us, is that this humble Jesus, this humble baby, is actually God's full frontal attack on the enemy and the kingdom of darkness. He is announcing in the language of, our, of World War II his D-Day invasion that will ultimately lead to his V-Day or victory that will happen at the cross. This little baby that's born will be the way in which God will bring about his victory. In other words, God has finally acted in history through this tiny sign, this tiny child, this baby, that will lead to his kingdom coming into the world. You know, in World War II, they would sometimes uh, put these stars in the, in the window. You may have seen these before. Uh, if somebody had a son that was in the war, and one Christmas Eve during World War II, uh, a, a boy was riding with his dad in the car, and they were going down the streets, and they could see these Christmas trees, and they could see these Christmas lights, and, and then they kept seeing in all these homes one of these stars in the window. And finally, the boy just says to his, he says to his dad, uh, why do they put those stars in, in the window? And his dad said, well, that's because they have a son in the war. A few minutes later, the boy looks up, and he sees the first star of, of the night, and he says, look, Dad. God must have a son in the war too. He's got a star in his window. Now, I love that story because I think it paints a picture for us that when we look back to Christmas, this is the sign in the sky that God has entered human history, that God has launched the spiritual invasion of his kingdom into this world, that God has a son in the war. This is his sign, this is a baby, but folks, let's be honest, there's more to that. This, as they look down into that little manger and see this little baby wrapped in clothes, this is the son of God. Now, notice I didn't say they saw a son of God, they saw the son of God. Do you know that to say that today in our world is not acceptable everywhere. In fact, one of the most dominant religions in the world today, the religion of Islam, denies both the death of Jesus on the cross and also the status of Jesus as the Son of God. And in fact, there are even versions of Christianity today, for example, the folks we, we know of as Jehovah Witnesses, who teach and maintain that Jesus was not the son of God. He was just a son of God. He was just, he was just a son in, a, in an ordinary sense of that. But I want to show you what the Bible actually says about who Jesus was and is and who the shepherds actually were looking at when they looked down into that manger. In John chapter 1 verse 18, John's gospel says, no one has ever seen God but the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, the old translation says, is in the bosom of the Father, has made him known. No one has ever seen God except his one and only Son. Well, you see those words, one and only. Some of your translations say only begotten. In the original language, it's just one word, monogenes. Monogenes, we have both those words, monogenes. You know what mono means? It means only or, or one, genes. Everybody knows what genes are today. It has to do with, with the begetting or the, the genetic. This is the only genetic 
descendant of God. It is Jesus. He's not just a son of God. He is the one and the only son of God. And that, that reality comes out of one of the most important verses in the Bible, the one we always remember, John chapter 3, verse 16, which says that God so loved the world that he gave his monogenes, his one and his only son. He didn't have any other son to give. He had a lot of angels, he could have sent them. He had a lot of people, he could have sent them. But the Bible tells us that he sent the thing that was most precious to him in all the world. It was his one and his only son. And we know what love is because God was willing to give his son. And that's what the shepherds were looking at when they were looking. You know, something interesting is go and read through the gospel sometime. And Jesus will talk about God as his father. He'll say, my father. It's always singular. He'll talk to his disciples. He'll say, when you guys pray, pray like this. Our Father. It's plural. We relate to God in terms of a plural understanding. We all know God as our Father. But Jesus has a personal, unique relationship with God because he is the one and only Son. None of us, by birth, are children of God. We have to become what the Bible refers to as being born again. We have to be adopted into God's family. We only get there through Jesus Christ. If you know the Son, you have life. If you don't know the Son of God today, you don't know life. You only get into the family through the Son. In fact, this verse says, this is how you do it. You believe in him, and you, don't, and you shall not perish, but you have eternal life, life abundant, life that never ends, life in the Son. Now, when Jesus was talking about this later on, he just said it kind of plainly in John 10, verse 30. It's one of the shortest verses in the Bible. He says, I and the Father are one. Jewish people always would pray the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4, that says, Here, you, o Israel, the Lord your God is Yahad, he is one. But Jesus says, you know what? I and the Father are one. As they were looking down, these shepherds who had seen the angels we're seeing a baby, not just any baby, but a very special baby. The sign and signature of God. This is his Messiah. This is the Lord. This is the Savior in the most humble of circumstances. But as they're looking down, they are seeing so much more than that. They are looking in to the face of God in the most humble way that you can possibly imagine. Theologians have referred to this through the centuries as the in Incarnation. God became a human being. God became one of us. If we want to understand what it's like to have a God-sized Christmas, is we need to understand that in Christmas, God provides his son and himself. We can look into Jesus and we can see who God is. In fact, that's what we should do. We should go to Bethlehem and see. You know, through the years, I've tried to understand and also tried to explain this, the incarnation, how God could become a man. And I, I like to tell uh, the story or the example, you might say, of a painting that is in the modern city of Rome. It was painted by an artist about 400 years ago named Rennie. It's his masterpiece. And it's in a beautiful hall. And on the top of the hall is this beautiful painting, recently redone, uh, and you can watch kind of like history documentaries about it because just this last year they went in, they redid it. But it is called The Dawn or Aurora. It's a painting of, of like the day when it begins and it's sort of running out into the world and, 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 and the dawn is happening. It's a beautiful painting. It's nine feet by 23 feet. In other words, about 200 square feet on the top of a dome-shaped ceiling there in Rome. And it's about... They say 100 feet, I don't think it's that tall, maybe 50 feet up. You can see this incredible painting, but the problem is it's so high, you really can't see it very well. And at one point in time, they decided to place on the floor one of these curved mirrors that reflects not only the ceiling, but then brings it down so that in order to see the beauty that's up here, you look down into the mirror. And you know what? That's what God was doing in Christmas. 
in order for God to show us so that we could see him, in order for God to show us who he is and what he is like, he gave us a sign, sealed, and delivered message, which was his son, Jesus Christ. And when we look down with the shepherds today into the manger, you know who we see? We see the face of God in Jesus. I wonder today, have you unwrapped what God wants for you for Christmas? Have you experienced for your life a God-sized Christmas? Do you know Jesus Christ as more than just a baby? But do you know him as the Son of God? Has he come to live inside of your life? The Bible says that if you receive him today and believe in him, then you become a child of God. It says that God comes and he lives inside of you. You know, Jesus didn't stay in a manger and he didn't stay on a cross because he was headed to a throne and he was gonna pour out his spirit so that he could come and live inside of our lives. Does he live in your life today? Do you know him? Have you seen him? Does he live in you? If he does, I have another question question for you you know a mom and her daughter were going home from Sunday school church one Sunday and a little girl said to her mom the preacher's sermon kind of confused me today I expect probably a lot of people say that around here you know with my sermons you know she said the preacher's sermon really confused me today I couldn't really figure it out and mom said well what do you mean she said well he said that God is bigger than we are is that true well, yeah, honey, that, that, that's true. But, but he also said that God lives in us. Is that true? And she said, yeah, that's true. He can come and live in us. And she just sat there and she scratched her head and she tried to figure this out. And she said, well, if God is bigger than us, and if God lives in us, wouldn't he show through? And I think that's a true question for us today. If we really understand who Jesus is, not just as a baby, not just as a sign and signature from God, but as the son of God who comes to live in our life, then shouldn't he, wouldn't he show through in our life? I hope for you that you have found a God-sized Christmas. And I hope that you have not just found that, but I hope that God in you and through you will shine out so that others too can have a God-sized Christmas. Let's pray together. Father, I'm just grateful for the opportunity at the end of this year to focus on Jesus so much more than the trivial songs that we sometimes sing this time of the year, fun that they are, but often marginalizing the significance or what we say, the reason for the season. Lord, I know that you acted in history and powerfully and gave us the sign and seal of that in that Jesus was born in the manger, that in the fullness of time you sent your son and that you were the redeemer. But more than that, God, we know that you sent your son who is your one and only. And my prayer today, Father, is that that truth would find its way into someone's heart and mind today. And Right now, even as I've been sharing this message, you've been preaching a message to their heart saying, today I need to be born again. I, I need to be adopted into the family of God. I need to have the, the Spirit of God living in me and for others to be able to see Jesus in me as well. And Lord, I pray for someone right now who needs to make that decision. But Lord, I pray for everybody else who's made that decision, that God, that, that just as that little girl said, that they would see Jesus through us as well. And I prayed in his name, amen. We're so glad you joined with us today. We want you to know that you have an opportunity to respond to the message that you just heard. If you have a prayer request, down in our link description, you can find a place where you can indicate that you'd like for us to pray for you. You also have an opportunity to connect with us to one of our Bible study groups to learn more about our church, or you also have the opportunity to join our church there. We also want you to know that you have an opportunity in this season as we finish this year, a special opportunity for giving. We call it our 515 offering, and 
Every December, we make it an effort to give as much as we can to provide all of the missional needs of our church for the following year. We want to give first and foremost to the Lord in order to do the mission work that we need to around the world. And we would love for you to be a part of our 515 offering. I want to remind you that we're going to be back in person next week. We want to encourage you to come back and be with us as we worship together. I hope you have not only a Merry Christmas, but a happy holiday and a new year. Around the world, and we would love for you to be opportunity for giving. We part of our five, call it our five fifteen fifteen offering offering and offering. I want to remind you every December we make it in that we're going to be back in person effort to give as much and next week as we can to provide we want to encourage you to come back into all of the missional need be with us as we worship of our church for the following together i hope you have a year we want to give first and have not only a merry christmas foremost